In this tutorial, let's consider three common types of torque problems. First, we have problems that are most clearly torque problems. In these cases, there's a clear pivot point. So the forces are more clearly causing a torque, like the wrench problem, where we might have multiple forces involved. Remember that torque is a vector quantity, and in our examples, we'll consider counterclockwise as positive. Of course, you can set directions however you wish, but you might as well start with the typical convention, that is, counterclockwise is positive. That's a good habit for university. So, our net torque on this bolt as a result of the forces on the wrench would be, well, the torque caused by F1, and that's applied at L over 2 from the pivot point. So the resulting torque, L over 2 times F1. And it's positive, as it's causing a counterclockwise torque. We also have the torque caused by F2. And it's at the end of the wrench, or a distance of L from the pivot point. And it's causing a torque of L times F2. But this time it's a negative as this one is causing a clockwise torque. And that's our net torque. Similarly, let's take a look at a teeter-totter situation. Similar in that there's a fairly obvious pivot point here. And we can see that FG1 is causing a counterclockwise torque. And it's applied at half the length of the teeter-totter. That's its radius of motion. So it contributes a positive L over 2 times FG1. Then FG2 is causing a clockwise torque at, again, half the length of the teeter-totter. So minus L over 2 times FG2. So in both cases, if the net torque is a positive, then we know that things will end up rotating in a counterclockwise direction. And if negative, it'll end up rotating in the clockwise direction. And of course, if the net torque was zero, it's in rotational equilibrium. The second common torque problem that we'll look at here involves gears or wheels and or chains or belts. Now in these cases, the pivot point is the axle and the forces are distributed along the edges of the gear or pulley. And we can just treat these as a single force anywhere along the edges. And the radius of rotation is simply the radius of that gear or pulley. And it doesn't matter where the forces are shown. For example, they could be aimed anywhere here, as long as it's along the outer surface of the gear or pulley, and therefore perpendicular to the radius. In a case like this, if counterclockwise is positive, then we can determine the net torque. F1 is pushing clockwise, and it's applied at a distance from the axle of, well, the radius of this gear is 2R. So our torque is negative 2R times F1. F2 is a positive, counterclockwise, and applied to the smaller gear with a radius of R. And finally, F3 is also a positive and applied to the larger gear with a radius of 2r. So we have an equation for our net torque and we're ready to plug in some numbers. If the net torque is a positive, then we know that things will end up rotating in the counterclockwise direction. If negative, it ends up rotating in the clockwise direction. And of course, if the net torque is zero, it's in rotational equilibrium. Now the last common type of torque problem that we'll look at here looks something like this. In these cases, it's not immediately evident that the problem should involve torque. That is, we don't have a clear pivot point. If we were asked to determine the upward force of the workers on this board, we'd take a look at it and probably guess that the worker on the right is having to apply a greater force than the worker on the left. To distribute the forces more evenly, the rock would probably be moved to the middle, right? 
So let's think about that and start our solution. I'd probably see this as a force problem and start it like this. A good free body diagram. And we show the workers as F1 and F2, say. And the weight of the rock, Fg. And in this case, we're considering that the weight of the board itself isn't significant, so that's not included in the free body diagram. F net equals MA, and it's in equilibrium, so A equals zero. Now with up being positive, we would have F1 plus F2 minus FG equals zero. And we could arrange that to be F1 plus F2 equals FG. Now, that's as far as we can get with our force equations. Now, does that mean they each lift half the weight of the rock? Well, like we guessed earlier, an even distribution is probably not a reasonable assumption here. We're stuck at this point. We have two unknowns and one equation, stalemate. So let's consider how torque might help us move forward with this. First, let's pick a pivot point. Now, a pivot point can be anywhere, but if we're strategic with our choice, we can take out one of those unknown forces, leaving only one unknown, which would be ideal. For example, if we chose here to be a pivot point, then F1 isn't providing any torque. There's no distance involved. So our torque equation around this point would look like this. Torque net equals, well, 2.5 meters times F2, and that's counterclockwise, so positive. And then we have 2 meters times Fg, and that's clockwise, so that would be negative. And it all equals zero. We can rearrange for F2, our unknown, and with some numbers, we could solve the force applied to that leading worker. Now to solve for the force applied by the other worker, we have two options. One is we can go back to the force equation that we made here and substitute in F2 and solve for F1, or we could do another torque equation. But this time, we would set the pivot point here to eliminate F2 from our equation. And again, we only have one unknown, in this case F1, so we can solve for it. So, torque equations can be used to solve problems that have an obvious pivot point, but they can also be used to solve problems that don't have an obvious pivot point. Consider torque as another powerful addition to your set of problem-solving tools.